Thank you very much for the introduction, and I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss today uh, this research, which is part of a, a research agenda that I started uh, uh, really in 1997, where by chance I was in Korea <laughs> during the crisis, propagating me to look at uh, the changes in reserve patterns uh, from uh, 97 that were led by Korea. And to a degree, uh, the big surprise of uh, the present event that Korea, after going through a massive crisis in 97, 98, when 10 years later, through another incarnation of a different crisis, but also crisis of liquidity. So the question that uh, I'm trying to raise here is, can we do better than hoarding reserves alone? Because after all, Korea excels in hoarding reserves as well as in conducting uh, uh, growth policies that uh, generated expected growth. And the answer that I'll try to convey is that indeed one can do better. And here this is only one example of a set of uh, models where there is a room to go beyond hoarding reserves due to precautionary motives. So turning to uh, the uh, purpose of the, this agenda is to studying optimal reserve and external debt management in a volatile environment. And my take is that the crisis, the recent one, illustrated that hoarding reserves is a potent self-insurance mechanism, yet hoarding reserves by itself is expensive and less efficient in the absence of assertive external debt management policies. And I'll try to convince you with the help of a quick overview of the recent history of reserves and external debt position of Korea and with a skeleton of a model and I'll skip the details of the model for the benefit of everybody in this uh, afternoon on Friday. <laughs> so let me uh, point out that the conjecture is that in the presence of externalities and here I will focus on congestion externalities but I can think about other types of ex externalities, there is room for a tax on external borrowing combined with hoarding international reserve subsidy scheme. Now these policies combined together reduce the social cost and the scale of hoarding reserves, co-funding, if you wish, reserve hoarding by the activities that expose the economy to the need to self-insure in the first place. And this scheme may mitigate the political demand in some emerging markets to spend reserves to finance various expenditures, which is not the case of Korea, it's more the case of Argentina or Venezuela and the like. So this is an item that I'm not going to discuss here. So uh, if, uh, if I'm trying to summarize the intuition of uh, the, this paper, uh, it's very similar to an open economy extension of the logic behind the policy of the FDIC. So if I'm depositing, say, $10,000 in my account in a bank that is part of the FDIC, and this is, the, for those that are not from the US, the FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which de facto implies that up to a threshold of quarter of a million, if the bank is part of the umbrella of the FDIC, in case of systemic failure or non-systemic failure, these deposits are insured. And then the idea is that if I'm putting $10,000 in my bank account, depending on the portfolio of my bank and the, its lending policy, I'm increasing the probability of a bailout, bailing me out, and uh, this uh, propagates the FDIC to impose a risk premium reflecting the risk category of the bank. And here at the bottom you can see that the risk premium ranges from 7 to close to 80, as there is significant dispersion. And this is an ex ante tax, if you wish, that suppose first to induce the bank to internalize partially uh, the, this greater exposure and uh, probably to fund partially the resources that in due course the FDIC will use. So the, in a nutshell, what I'm uh, illustrating here is an open economy extension dealing with this. So I'll review briefly holding reserves before the crisis. I'll focus on, only on the big picture. Uh, during the crisis, uh, we have seen a reallocation of the market sentiments 
in emerging markets from the fear of floating to the fear of using reserves. And I'll focus mostly on uh, the case of Korea. I don't have the time to review the other uh, facts that are spread down in the paper. Then I'll focus on the model of costly financial intermediation in emerging markets with fi fire sale externalities, which is uh, akin to a diamond and digby type of uh, structure. And uh, uh, I'll end with policy implications and some concluding remarks. So uh, this, is, uh, this crisis is really the first serious global test of modern financial globalization. Of course, 97, 98, uh, we had a mega crisis in uh, the region, but this was not really a global crisis. So this is really the first, if you wish, test of global <coughs> financial integration, which in earnest started, if you recall, in the 80s, at the end of the collapse of the Bretton system, on behalf of the OECD countries, and from the 90s, emerging markets joined this trend. And my reading is that the fallouts may include the financial market integration of emerging markets. We observe the proliferation of soft capital controls, space of muddling through sovereign defaults and bailouts, including Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Gr Greece is not here, so you should be able to guess when I wrote the PowerPoint, but chances are that Greece is not the last domino and the like. Now, the regulatory changes so far are timid. No reason to expect the end of financial turbulence facing emerging markets, which remain exposed to sudden stops and deleveraging crisis. And I'd argue that proper management of debt and balance sheet exposure remains a key challenge facing developing countries, and this cannot be done simply by using and focusing on the reserves. One should supplement this with other policies, and here I articulate one example. So uh, if you are going back to the insurance uh, theory, uh, with hazard impacted by agents' behavior, optimality calls for a mixture of partial insurance and preventing methods, reducing the frequency and the intensity of the calamity, hence uh, it makes sense uh, to require me to, to install a fire alarm and external lights in my house as a mechanism of reducing the probability of the hazard and then the risk may be adjusted. And with all the differences, similar logic may apply to emerging markets exposed to sudden stops and deleveraging. De de and the logic implies supplementing holding reserves with policies that would reduce the exposure to external debt. And there is a, a growing literature going back at least to Eichen, Green et al, pointing out that external debt, maturity and currency mismatches increase the downside risk of sudden stop, of inflow of capital, or a crisis of capital flight. Greater balance sheet exposure implies that greater distress and higher expected foregone out output cost of a crisis. And if most agents are price takers, each ignores his marginal impact on increasing the expected cost of such a crisis. And this in turn entails an externality akin to conge congestion. Congestion goes back to transportation. So if I'm heading to the airport here, I ignore the negative effect of this on the traveling time of all the other drivers, leading to a negative externality that can be internalized by the proper structure of taxes. The logic here is uh, similar. It operates as well in the capital market in diverse circumstances <coughs> where agents are price taker and where the probability of uh, a crisis or whatever is the event is impacted by the margin. And here, the, uh, one convenient example is fire sale, sale externality. And the idea is that a deleveraging crisis in <coughs> induces a large number of banks to simultaneously liquidate investments. So coming from California, to exemplify this, Stockton is 45 minutes from <coughs> San Francisco. Seven years ago, when there was a foreclosed house in Stockton, it took maybe a day to liquidate it, and the transaction cost was low. Today, a third of the real estate in Stockton is foreclosed. The cost of selling a house is very high. It takes more time. There is a, the, the depreciation in the quality of the life in the entire community. Crime is going up, but also there is a physical depreciation of the property. All this is part of what um, uh, we refer as fire sale externality. 
Now, a, a liquidation increases the cost of deleveraging, requiring each bank to liquidate more of its investment to obtain the dollar required to meet the deleveraging in the case of systemic liquidation, where it's not one house, but third of the stock of capital, of capital or the real estate in Stockton. While each bank takes pot potential fire sale prices as given, taken together, their action as a group induce the fire sale pri prices, implying that there may be a role for a policy. What you see here is the recent history from uh, 1980 of reserve hoarding as a fraction of the GDP. The bottom curve is the OECD, no trend, it's almost flat. The big story is the red curve, developing countries. Within 25 years, we observe practically the quantiple of their hoarding of reserves. China, of course, is an outlier. At the beginning of the period, it was close to zero, by now it's 50% of the GDP. Let me skip the details of it. I can uh, spend uh, several hours dis discussing it, but this is really the background to the big story, which in a paper with Jay Woolley from the IMF, we linked the massive increase in holding reserves to the trend of greater financial integration of developing countries. So what you see at the top is the average ratio of reserves to GDP in two blocks, the OECD, which is the flat curve, and above the curve that is taking off about the 90s is the developing countries. Now, this seemed to coincide with the timing of the massive increase in financial integration of developing countries, and this you can see at the bottom, the curve that is taking off is re related to capital account liberalization index normalized to 1980 of developing countries. Now, of course, timing is not causality, and in this uh, paper with Jay Woolley, we attempted to control for other factors, and the main result was that uh, the degree of financial integration of developing countries is positively uh, associated with holding reserves after controlling for other factors. Presumably, this is the precautionary motive to have reserves to self-insure you against systemic events. Now, uh, let me point out that uh, interpretation of uh, the uh, recent uh, crisis of Korea is that a country with a damp pool of reserves tried initially to defend its currency with a massive but ineffective foreign <coughs> currency intervention and is ultimately re rescued by a combination of swap agreements and partial use of its reserves by to the tune of not more than 25% of the initial reserves. Now, let me skip the details of it. Instead, I'll turn out uh, really to the big uh, story of the history of Korea uh, and reserves. So uh, let me go back to the early 90s. The uh, curve at the bottom is the ratio of reserves to GDP. The next curve is short-term external debt to GDP. And the red curve at the top is total external debt GDP. And if you recall, 97 was a classical case of liquidity crisis. Reserves happened to approach zero at a time where there was a, a large exposure to <coughs> external debt. And Korea being a country that is presumably both risk averse and a country characterized by high saving rate, reached rapidly a situation that if you are going back to 2004, it seemed to be that Korea managed to cover itself fully in the sense that reserves at that window exceeded both the <coughs> total external debt GDP and the short-term external debt GDP. Yet it took less than four years to reach the crisis where, of course, we observed that this was not the case. What happened is, if you are looking more carefully, Reserve to GDP remained flat, but the authorities, due to various reasons that we can articulate, but I don't have the time, allowed growing, rapidly growing exposure to external debt, both short-term and long-term. And there is a nice paper that I'm referring here that uh, points out that a lot of this increase was the outcome of really carry trade uh, related to Japan, foreign branches played a role, and there was also an important element of commercial hedging related to the fact that Korea cornered several global markets of uh, selling container ships and other markets. But the main point is that uh, one uh, may ask to what degree it's in the self-interest of Korea 
uh, to allow this type of massive increase in exposure to external debt without changing reserves, where at least a third of this is used really by foreign agents to finance carry trade. I'm not convinced that it's in the interest of Korea, but it's up to you to make your mind. But at least the point that I'm trying to make here is that the attempt of Korea to use its massive reserves to pacify the market, including a bailout of to the tune of $100 billion, was not enough. Let me skip the details. They were covered by the paper earlier by a paper by Packer and Shim. And the bottom line is that uh, arguably only when the, the swap line of the Fed was extended, partially used, and then the, the <coughs> assessment was that the Fed is willing to come to the rescue of Korea beyond 30 billion, only then the market stabilized. What you see here is a recent paper with E, where we are pointing out that looking at the emerging markets that lost more than 10% of their reserves during the crisis, let us focus on the crisis window, which is the fourth quarter of 2008. The average loss of reserves was huge, close to $30 billion of the average emerging markets, and we have 10 emerging markets that lost a lot of reserves during that window. Half of this, on average, was used to finance the deleveraging of external debt. And this is really the main, the core of the argument, that uh, ex ante it makes sense to prevent or to adapt policies that will internalize this exposure. So the remaining of the time, I'll outline the model. It's akin to the version of Diamond Digvid, Bank finance investment in long-term projects, a liquidity shock may force costly liquidation of the earlier investment, reducing future output. Here I'm adapting three simplified assumptions. I can relax all of them. Uh, the first is financial intermediation is done only by banks and debt contracts. No separation between the bank and the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is the bank owner, using the bank to finance investment. No distinction is made between the private sector and the central bank, which maintain the stock of reserves. And I'm assuming to simplify that all marginal funding is done by external debt. And we focus here on the implications of liquidation costs on the demand for reserves for self-insurance purposes. And the timing of the model is that at the beginning of period one, external borrowing D, financing plan investment and hoarding reserves. So reserve is, is R. So K to P is the planned investment to materialize at the end of period two. Now, at the end of period one, a liquidity shock uppercase Z, where a fraction lowercase Z of depositors would like to ma materialize their de <coughs> deposit. They don't want to wait to the second period. Now, I'm ruling out sovereign default. Due to reasons that are not modeled, the assumption is that Korea is not Argentina, has sovereign default will not happen. So if the reserves are positive, they will be used as a first defense. If the ZD, the liquidity shock, is exceeding reserves, then there will be real costly liquidation of tangible investment, reducing the actual stock of capital from K to P to K2, and theta here is the cost of liquidation, and the key externality is through theta, and I'll elaborate on this shortly. Output materializes at period two, and depositors that waited patiently are paid. Net reserves that were not used are yielding the risk-free interest rate. So let me point out that uh, we assume a risk neutrality here, and uh, let me skip details, but uh, if the Z, the liquidity shock, has the support between zero and tau, there is a, a certain Z star which uh, separates the, the possible realizations of the liquidity shock into the range of no liquidation versus partial liquidation. Now, the idea here is to focus on fire cell congestion externalities and deleveraging, de and here the point is that the liquidation cost, theta, depends positively on the aggregate liquidation by N identical banks. We assume that N is large, and if you are looking at the liquidation cost, it's the product of N times the liquidation of a typical bank. Now, the, the 
mu at the bottom is the elasticity of the liquidation cost with respect to liquidation of each atomistic bank. It's relatively small relative to the aggregate elasticity, which is n times this elasticity. And this is really the source of the externality. So the next step, identifying the expected second period surplus, and then I'm comparing the competitive equilibrium versus the equilibrium of the planner. And let me skip details, but there are two really first order conditions. One is optimal reserves, the second optimal deposits, and skipping the <coughs> math, let me point out that the main effect of congestion externalities is that in states of deleveraging, fire cell externalities increase the marginal social benefit of hoarding reserves by a term that is proportional to the externa externality, which is the number of banks times the elasticity of uh, the deleveraging cost facing each bank <coughs> times theta and the like. And in the same vein, it reduces the marginal social benefit of borrowing. So the next step is deriving policies, and the first case that I'm considering is that the case where <coughs> only borrowing, external borrowing tax is applied, and there is no subsidy to hoarding reserves, and the outcome is that it, the social optima, uh, optimal policy is a tax T, which is proportionate to the externality. Now, case B is more a richer one, allowing both borrowing tax and holding subsidy. And these are the formal uh, results. Both of these policies are related, are proportionate to the externality. But of course, the subsidy implies that the treasury is paying some funds. The tax <coughs> is the opposite. And a key result here is that the tax is exceeding the subsidy such that the net tax revenue collected by the authorities is positive, and it can be shown to be the product of the fire sale externality times the expected liquidation cost in states that liquidation is happening, or will happen. Now, uh, this is a, a public finance exposition. It's partial equilibrium drawn for a given reserve, R, and the bottom line is a, a competitive behavior. The expected marginal product of deposits is downward sloping, and then the competitive equilibrium implies a, a level of deposits D0, but due to the fire, fire cell externality, the social external marginal benefit of deposits is below due to the congestion externality, and the tax is capturing this discrepancy. Well, let me point out that in states of deleveraging, de fire cell externality increases the marginal social benefit of holding reserves and it reduces the marginal social benefit of borrowing and the welfare consequences of the externality may be alleviated by the proper combination of taxing foreign borrowing and subsidizing, subsidizing hoarding reserves. And the net tax revenue collected by the authorities is positive, implying that even an emerging market that is lean in terms of its capacity to collect taxes can use this structure. Now, let me close by pointing out that uh, there are maybe other alternatives to massive holding reserves. Here, the alternative that I'm highlighting is using this tax scheme to reduce the exposure of the country, but still at the margin, we are relying on uh, uh, holding reserves. A, a deeper use of swap line is one alternative. Reserve pooling arrangement is another. Channeling reserves into potentially higher yielding but riskier assets like sovereign wealth funds. Well, each option is useful. These alternatives are not a panacea. Swap lines are typically for short duration, limited by moral hazard considerations and the willingness of the Fed or the supplier to provide them. And diversification by sovereign wealth fund has other issues. So uh, I would say that uh, the main uh, point of this exercise is to argue in the context of Korea and practically all emerging markets that the mis I believe that the mistake of Korea was focusing from 2004 on maintaining stable reserve to GDP while allowing rapid increase in the total external debt both uh, uh, and also the short term external debt GDP ratio. And one can alleviate this by being more sensitive with respect to the marginal impact of uh, such borrowing on the exposure of a country. 
In the paper, I'm arguing that uh, Brazil uh, is using recently more assertively, assertively such a, a policy. And uh, uh, if you are looking at the balance sheet exposure of Korea on the day of the crisis, it was at least 10 or 15 percent of the GDP uh, of Brazil. It was close to zero. And this may explain why Brazil didn't use the swap line, why if you are looking at the loss of uh, reserves by Brazil during the crisis, it was only 10 percent of the GDP. Uh, Korea used part of the swap line and lost 25 percent of the GDP, and Brazil and Korea uh, depreciated by close to 30 percent uh, because of the net balance sheet exposure of Brazil was close to zero. There was no obvious effect there. Uh, my view is that it's not only luck that allowed Brazil to do it. The history of Brazil is that Arminio Fraga was a very good governor of the Central Bank, coming from a hedge fund. He understood, I think, the risk of exposing the country to hedge funds. And then he was willing, really, to manage proactively the balance sheet exposure of Brazil. It goes back to a point in time that I recall in a close event, he said that at a certain day, he noted that balance sheet exposure of Brazil was zero, so he decided to devalue the currency by 20 percent. And he saw at the time that it still was quasi peg, and this was a very good devaluation. So it goes back to the mantra that the key is not reserve position, the key is balance sheet exposure. And I think that all energy markets, including Korea, will do better by looking at what Armenia Fraga delivered to Brazil, and uh, I think that one can do better. Thank you very much.